Now, Biosova is a game. Uh, to apply it, we have to integrate. And when you have to integrate, you know, that can be very costly. You might need a big computer to do the integral. So again, even though we've got an answer, what does any set of currents, you give me any set of currents and you want to know what magnetic field it sets up, I've got the answer. I just apply Biosova. But sometimes that integral is just too difficult to do. So instead of doing that, we'd like a simpler way of setting up the problem. In the case of the electric field, how did we get our simpler method? We took the electric field and we studied the divergence of the electric field and the curl of the electric field. And eventually that led us to Laplace's equation and there are all kinds of tricks for solving Laplace's equation and Poisson's equation. Okay? So here too, what we would like to do is we would like to take the magnetic field and calculate its curl and its divergence. For the case of the electric field, we really took the, the, the field set up by single point charge and we calculated the divergence of the curl. Okay? Here I'm going to tell you what the answer is for calculating the divergence of the curl. It's exactly the same. We've had practice in calculating divergence of curl, so we're not going to calculate those now. So I'll just tell you the answer. So, Let's write the equations for electricity on one side and the equations for magnetism on the other. So, can someone remind me what was the divergence of the electric field? Great, rho over epsilon naught. Is this equation only true in electrostatics or is it true in the full electrodynamics? True in electrodynamics. Good. What was the curl of E equal to zero? Is this true in the full electrodynamics? Only electrostatics. Good. Only in electrostatics. Then, if you calculate the divergence of the B field, you take B or sub R and you just work out what's the divergence of B. This is zero. Is that true in electrodynamics or not? Yes, it is. So the divergence of B is true in full electrodynamics. This is one of Maxwell's equations. The curl of B is equal to mu naught times the current density. Does anybody know what this is called? Ampere's law. Is this true in electrodynamics? No. <laughs> It's only true in magnetostatics. The equation that is true in full electrodynamics that replaces this one was discovered by Faraday. And that's called Faraday's law. So we'll figure out what that is. The equation that Maxwell had to change to make all of electromagnetism into one consistent theory was this equation. He had to add a new correction on the side. Okay? And we'll go through Maxwell's equation for why that gets corrected. What did the divergence tell us about the geometry of the field lines? Where the field lines end and where they start. Electric field lines end and start on charges. Magnetic field lines never end. 
If there was a north pole by itself or a south pole by itself, then a magnetic field line could end. Now you guys may have seen magnets with a north and a south. If you break it in half to try to get the north by itself and the south by itself, okay, that doesn't work. Okay, have you guys tried that? You get two smaller pieces and they've each got a north and a south. You can never break them apart. Okay? There's no north poles by themselves or south poles by themselves. There was one group of physicists who had a superconducting um, experiment. They, they were having a current flowing in a hoop and they could detect if one magnetic monopole went through the middle of the hoop because they detected as a change in the current flow. And they found one magnetic monopole. But they never found another one, and no one else found one. So no one believes they found the first one. <laughs> so at this point, we don't think that there are magnetic monopoles. It seems to be an experimental fact. Maxwell's equations would allow magnetic monopoles, but they don't seem to be any in nature. Okay? The curl of E is zero. What does that tell you? There's no closed field lines. The curl of B is mu naught j. What does that tell you? Current set up magnetic fields and all of the magnetic field lines are closed. Okay? That's telling you about the geometry of the field lines. Good. Now, we can write an integral form of Ampere's law. got the curl of B is equal to mu naught J. Can you guys tell me if I want to write an integral version, so I want to integrate that equation, what do you think I should integrate them over? I could integrate the two sides over a line, or I could integrate them I guess over a surface. See I could dot them both with dx and integrate over some path. Or I could dot them both with dA and integrate them over some surface. What integral should I do? And why? And don't say dot with dx for practice. Which integral should I do and why? A volume integral? Interesting choice. Did the curl appear in any of our integral formulas? The curl never appeared? Stokes. Where did the curl appear? In what kind of an integral? Relating surface to a volume, was it? Emil, what were we relating? Surface to line integral. So now those are the choices. Do you want to do surface or line? Okay, I heard line and surface. We want to do surface. So if you look back to Stokes' theorem, so that's where I'm looking, Stokes' theorem. Stokes' theorem told us what is the integral of a curl. And it was this thing integrated over an area. So what I want to do is, I'm going to integrate both of those over some area. So integral over some area of the curl of B dot dA must be equal to mu naught integral J dot dA over some area A. And, and by the way, remember, we have to take J and dot it with a dA to get a current. So the natural thing that you do with J is integrate it over an area. Okay? So this side of the equation also seems very natural to integrate it over an area. So when we integrate that, we're just going to get the total current flowing through the surface. So mu <coughs> naught times by I, let's say, through A. That's the current flowing through A. And on this side, if we now apply Stokes' theorem, we'll get the integral of B dot dr over some closed path C. How is C related to A? 
C is the boundary of A. Very good. The orientation of the boundary is related to the direction of DA, which is related to the current, because this is the current flowing in the direction DA. So in fact, the direction of the current tells you about the orientation of C. Now, so this is the integral form of Ampere's law. And the integral form of Ampere's law is the simplest thing to use if you have a problem that has symmetry. So, imagine you have here, whoopsie daisy. Imagine you have here an infinitely long wire, and there's a current flowing through that wire. If we have an infinitely long wire, there's a nice symmetry. We can rotate it and nothing changes. So we know that the magnetic field must respect that rotational symmetry. The other thing is that for this case, if the current is flowing in that way, you know, there's another right-hand rule, they're all right-hand rules, but if the current is flowing in that way, the magnetic field curls like that around this wire. Okay? That's uh, how to get the magnetic field. I want to now use that integral form of Ampere's law to get the current flowing, uh, to get the magnetic field set up by the current <coughs> in this wire. When we calculated the electric field from an infinitely long charged rod, how did it fall off? One over? Two pi r. Why? The field spread out in two dimensions, right? So we landed up getting a fall off of the field of one over two pi r. In this case, let's take a look. If we look at this equation, I will... There's my current carrying wire. It's infinitely long, so it keeps going. I have a circle with radius r. All points along this loop are at the same distance from that piece of wire. Because of that, the magnetic field at all points along this loop will have the same magnitude. They're all the same distance from the piece of wire. If I do a rotation, those points will be swapped amongst each other. They must all have the same magnitude by symmetry. Um, next thing, that's the way the current is flowing. So the orientation of the path is like that. So it goes in that direction at the back and that direction at the front. So if I now calculate the integral of b dot dr, I will get b times by 2 pi, actually let's make this a little r, r. The value of the magnetic field is like the same at all points along the path. The length of the path is 2 pi r. And this must be equal to mu naught times the current that's flowing in that wire, I. So we now learn that B is equal to mu naught I over 2 pi R. How does the magnetic field fall off? 1 over 2 pi R, just like the electric field. And when you say that you're moving out in the space, that's not specific to the electric field or the magnetic field. So you should expect the same fall off for the two fields. What is the direction of the magnetic field? If you call that direction the phi hat direction, it's in the phi hat direction. Okay. It's curling around. So the magnetic field is uh, like this. It's coming out of the board there, going into the board there, going up there, coming down there. It's, the magnetic field is curling around that piece of wire. And you can see explicitly, look, that's a closed field line. Just like we said, this equation said it had to be. Any questions on that, guys? Okay, so, so we've got to the end of the lecture. We'll get to the joke in a moment. First of all, good luck for the quiz, those of you who are writing the quiz. Okay, once the quiz is out of the way, I hope you're going to go up to your room and uh, sleep. And uh, then tomorrow we'll get back to normal. Okay? So get the quiz out of the way and then we're A for a while. Okay, so let me think. Um, okay. Today's joke 
is about a psychologist. But that psychologist is studying a mathematician and a physicist. <laughs> so what the psychologist would like to learn is what is the difference in the way a physicist thinks and the difference in the way a mathematician thinks. So the psychologist decides a good thing to do is give them both a simple task. Give them both a notebook and they have to write down in the notebook exactly what steps they followed to complete the task. So he sets up the whole experiment and the physicist comes in first and he says to the physicist, look, I want you to make a cup of coffee. So the physicist says, okay, walks into this room, he looks, there's the coffee machine, it's not plugged in, so he plugs the coffee machine in. Then he takes a look, there's no water in the coffee machine, so he fills the coffee machine with water. Then he takes a look, there's no filter paper in the coffee machine, so he puts filter paper in. Then he takes a look, there's no coffee beans in the uh, coffee machine, so he puts coffee beans in. Then he takes a look, it's not switched on, so he switches it on. And then the machine starts working, it produces the coffee, then he takes the jug, he pours out the cup of coffee, and um, he writes his instructions. So he says, number one, you have to plug the coffee machine in. Number two, fill the coffee machine with water. Number three, put the filter paper into the machine. Number four, put the beans into the machine. Number five, switch the machine on. Number six, pour your cup of coffee. Good. So he walks out, he gives the psychologist, there's my notebook with the steps. The psychologist thinks, great. Then, they take the mathematician to a room, prepared in exactly the same way. The mathematician goes in, he does exactly the same thing, writes down exactly the same steps. Fine. So the psychologist takes a look and thinks, well, I didn't learn very much because they did exactly the same thing. So he thinks, okay, we'll repeat the experiment tomorrow, but I'll change the conditions. So the next day, the physicist walks in, he looks, the coffee machine is plugged in. It's filled with water, the filter paper is there, the coffee beans are there. So all he does is he switches the machine on, and then when it's finished, he pours a cup of coffee. So he says, step number one, switch the machine on. Step number two, pour the coffee. Fine. Then the mathematician goes into his room, prepared in exactly the same way. So he looks at it, he's very confused, he opens his notebook again, he looks at it, he thinks, he thinks a little bit more, he looks again, then he all of a sudden he has an idea. So he takes the filter paper, and he carefully puts the coffee beans back into the box where the coffee beans were. <laughs> then he folds the filter paper carefully and he puts it back into the box with all of the filter papers. Then he empties all of the water out of the coffee machine. <laughs> he puts the coffee machine back. Then he unplugs it. Then he writes in his notebook, number one, remove the coffee beans. Number two, fold the filter paper carefully, put it back into the box. Number three, remove the water from the machine. Number four, unplug the machine. Number five, you have now reduced today's problem to yesterday's problem. <laughs> solve it as you solved it yesterday. Okay guys, that's it. See you tomorrow.